Psalm 139 verses 7 to 10 ask, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. Amen. Welcome to Frank Street. Baptist online church service. We have an abridged service for you today. I will continue with a pastoral prayer after these opening remarks. In the comfort of your own homes, please join us in the responsive reading and sing out loud to the hymn chosen by Dan. Then I will finish with a sermon entitled, Where Do We Go From Here? and close with a benediction blessing. Thanks for joining us today. Let us pray. Lord God, maker and shepherd of all, we thank you that we cannot flee from your presence. We praise you that you care for us so much that you will not let us wallow in the depths, that you will not abandon us in dark places. Father, thank you for lifting our spirits, for enabling us to sense your guidance. Thank you for holding tight to us, for claiming us as your own, for being with us at all times and in all seasons. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you alone are sovereign. You alone are all-powerful and wise. Your compassion knows no end, and it is upon you, Almighty God, whom we depend. Jesus, your commission was that we go and make disciples of all nations. When we look at the nations of the world, we see that people of the Caribbean island of St. Vincent need help because of La Soufrière volcano erupting on Friday. We see that COVID-19 is straining the Brazilian health care system and those around the world. We see that particle physicists are reevaluating their determinations of how the universe works. Flooding in Southeast Asia, a military coup in Myanmar, gun violence, hatred, and racism are featured in our news. Father, just as we are appalled at injustices and suffering that we see in other countries, Lord, help us to stand against those evils and give of ourselves to help those in need here and wherever such atrocities occur. Open our eyes and our hearts to the homelessness and the hunger that reigns in this world. Lord, help us to glorify you as we try to meet those needs. Forgive us for the times when we have not been compassionate, when we have been anxious and selfish. During this lockdown, help us to help others in your name. Give us the words that comfort and uplift. Keep us grounded in your word. Instill within us a desire to seek you out in prayer and fellowship with one another. Bless and keep the Susies, the Van Buscombs, and all who serve as missionaries seeking to glorify your name. When you walked this earth, Lord Jesus, you taught with authority. You fed and healed many of diverse diseases. Today we bring before you those who need your healing. We give you Emily, Henry, Johanna, Nancy Hopkins, Elsie, Annika, Betty, Liv and Arlene, Donna, Mary Lou, Michelle, Andrea, and all those known to each one of us. We ask that you comfort Gladys, Faye, Yvonne, Mary, Barb, and all who mourn the loss of someone 
whom they have loved. Lord, asking for your intervention, telling you of our cares is a blessing. Knowing that our lives are in your hands, we ask for your continued protection, that we may please you in what we do and in what we say. Bring the unsaved into your fold, Father, so that they may know what mercy and peace belong to those who trust in Jesus as their risen Savior. In the name of our mediator, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Psalm 138 I will praise you, Lord, with all my heart. I will bow down toward your holy temple. For you have so exalted your solemn decree that it surpasses your fame. May all the kings of the earth praise you, Lord, when they hear what you have decreed. Though the Lord is exalted, he looks kindly on the lowly. Though lofty, he sees them from afar. You stretch out your hand against the anger of my foes. The Lord will vindicate me.
Well, hello everyone. Here we are again in another stay at home order. With all our legislated time at home lately, I'm assuming that you've had time to clean out all of your closets again. And I've been able to master a few new hobbies and skills that you didn't get around to during the first two lockdowns. On Thursday morning, the first day of the latest emergency lockdown, I was outside hanging clothes on the line. The sun was shining and all kinds of birds were chirping and singing and squawking. And in that moment, I was reminded that God has things under control. He is orchestrating the changing season and the earth is set in just the right place and tilted at just the right angle for life to thrive here. As well, all those birds that were filling the air with sound on that sunny Thursday morning, even the squawkers, reminded me that each one of us is cared for by our Heavenly Father. Whether we are chirpers or singers or squawkers, we are all cared for by our Holy Creator. I consider myself a squawker, by the way. Today we're picking up where we left off last Sunday in the book of John. On Easter Sunday, we read how Mary had been weeping outside of Jesus' empty tomb, and we saw how her weeping and wailing was transformed into joy when she recognized Jesus was with her. I hope that you too can relate to Mary's experience. The joy that lives with within us when we, as those faithful to Christ, realize that Jesus is indeed with us. The end of last week's passage described Mary's obedience and privilege in going to the other disciples with the news that Jesus was risen from the dead. Before I read the verses that follow, that begin with the words on the evening of that first day of the week, I want to briefly fill in the space between Mary's encounter with Jesus early on the first day of the week while it was still dark and the evening of that first day of the week where today's scripture reading begins. According to this timeline of Jesus's post-resurrection appearances, mm -hmm. after the Gospels recordings of Jesus' appearance to the women at the tomb, Jesus appears to Cephas and another follower on the road to Emmaus. After their eyes are opened and they realize that they have just encountered their risen Lord, they returned to Jerusalem and confirmed Jesus alive to the 11 disciples gathered together. That takes us to today's reading from the 20th chapter of John, verses 19 to 23. May God bless us in the reading, hearing, and understanding of his word to us. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Amen. Where do we go from here? Here we are as residents of the province of Ontario in the year of our Lord 2021 under a provincial emergency and stay at home order issued by the Ontario government in consultation with the chief medical officer of health and other health experts in an effort to keep us safe. This is the third declaration of a provincial emergency under the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act. As you know, the government has issued a province-wide stay-at-home order requiring everyone to remain at home except for essential purposes. 
such as going to the grocery store or pharmacy, accessing health care services for outdoor exercise or for work that cannot be done remotely. In response to the question, where do we go from here, I'm hoping, as I'm sure you are, that this will be the last lockdown as people become vaccinated and the spread is slowed. The whole experience has been fear inducing. Our normal routines and interactions have been replaced with quick masked interactions at best. We have been trying to protect ourselves from an invisible enemy that has killed almost 3 million people. It is no wonder that people have become fearful. Being locked in and locked down, it's hard to escape any fear we may be feeling because we have been given a stay at home sentence time to reflect in confinement. A lot of famous people have reflected upon the subject of fear. You are familiar, I'm sure, with Franklin D. Roosevelt's The Only Thing We Have to Fear is Fear Itself. Poet Ralph Waldo Emerson postulated that fear always springs from ignorance. And he urged, do the thing you fear and death of fear is certain. Jonathan Lockwood Huey claims that fear is the root of the tree of suffering. I came across this one from Austrian poet and novelist Rainer Maria Rilke's assertion that our deepest fears are like dragons guarding our deepest treasure. I found that one kind of interesting. Along that same vein, motivational speaker and author Steve Pavlina is quoted as saying, Fear is not your enemy, it is a compass pointing you to the areas where you need to grow. Well, as much as we are told that fear is composed of two primary reactions, biochemical and emotional, to some type of perceived threat, today's scripture shows us that our lack of trust in God, our fear points us to the areas where we need to grow. John records that on the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked, they were in fear of the Jewish leaders. Why were the disciples fearful of the Jewish leaders? Well, if the religious leaders could successfully falsely accuse, try and execute the Son of God, what would stop them from exacting the same sentence upon Jesus' followers? If they were not satisfied with the death of Jesus, their leader, they may pursue his followers as well. In fact, Jesus himself warned the disciples that he was the reason the world hates you. Jesus warned them and us, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. Before his arrest, Jesus warned his disciples that they will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. How could these words of Jesus not be ringing in their ears and cause his disciples to gather together behind locked doors? In what must have seemed like a blur in a matter of days, the whole world of Jesus's faithful had been turned upside down. Just days earlier, they had come into Jerusalem with Jesus amidst adulation and celebration. Their master was heralded with expressions of adoration, praise and joy. Hosanna, they shouted. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. They were surrounded by people waving palm branches and covering the dusty road with their cloaks and clothing. This was one of those mountaintop experiences when it felt good to be a disciple. However, all that came to a screeching halt. Peter, Jesus' closest disciple, vehemently denied even knowing the Lord. 
Matthew describes how Peter denied with an oath and even began to call down curses as he swore to them, I don't know the man. This was the same man who had earlier answered Jesus' question, but what about you, Jesus had asked him. Who do you say that I am? To which Peter confidently answered, you are the Messiah. We know how easy it is to affirm and proclaim our faith amongst a sympathetic crowd of like-minded people. Yet how often do we deny knowing Jesus when we fail to disagree or we avoid going against the flow in a conversation or in an activity? In a matter of days, Jesus' disciples had witnessed Christ's hero welcome into Jerusalem to enduring a farcical trial, to being physically beaten and tortured, to being verbally accused, accosted and shamed, and to finally suffering crucifixion as the innocent lamb sacrificed for our sin. The one for whom they had left their families, work and lives for, was now gone. So here they were, huddled together, dreading a knock on the door by the Roman soldiers seeking their lives. To say their world had been turned upside down is an understatement, and I'm sure I would not have proven any braver. I think it's safe to say this pandemic has turned our world upside down. We feel like we have to sit at home with our doors locked up tight. The sound of the doorbell strikes fear into our hearts. That is upside down. Anytime someone who we love dies, our world turns upside down. Anytime we lose our jobs and we fear a phone call from creditors, our world turns upside down. Anytime a relationship breaks down, our world turns upside down. Anytime we get a diagnosis, our world turns upside down. And it's that kind of an upheaval and fear for their lives that Jesus' early disciples were up against. Look at what happens though. The doors were locked for fear of the Jewish leaders and Jesus didn't startle them by banging on the door like the authorities officers would have done. The Bible simply says that Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Jesus came to calm their fear. That peace that Jesus leaves with those who trust in him, that peace that he gives those who proclaim him as the risen son of God is not as the world gives peace or defines peace. God's peace envelops our spirit. It is God's spirit of rest, comfort, wholeness, and assurance that he blesses all believers with. It is a peace that keeps our hearts from being troubled and fearful. Even amidst a pandemic, we can be at peace. We can be that calming influence for people who are tossed to and fro by the latest theories and statistics. And notice that Jesus came in a way that transcended the disciples and our own understanding in order to be with them. And we shouldn't be surprised because even Old Testament writers remind us that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and save those who are crushed in spirit. He knit us together. In the call to worship, I read verses from Psalm 139. In earlier verses of that same Psalm, the writer acknowledges God's omnipresence and knowledge saying, before a word is on my tongue, you Lord know it completely. Our God is invested in our lives. He knows where we are at. He knows if we are fearful as we are locked away from the world. He knows our hurts and disappointments. He has not only invested the life of his son as payment for our sins, as we have read in this passage, the everlasting Holy One 
sets his seal of ownership on us and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. Even with all of our struggles, he puts his seal of ownership upon us. It kind of make it kind of makes me think of a ring that I was given um, by my grandparents. This now the stone is chipped and scratched, and it badly needs a cleaning. It's bent to the shape of my finger, and it is missing some of those prongs that actually hold the stone in place. But I still value it. God values us so much, so much more, even though we are scarred and scraped and cracked and chipped, that we need it and we need a cleaning and we're bent out of shape. God values us so much. In his perfection, Jesus offered himself as a sacrifice for us. Jesus did not have his life taken from him. He attests, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. Jesus chose to lay down his life for us who are sinners. God's love was so great for us that he gave Jesus as full payment and as a deposit of immeasurable value, guaranteeing what is to come, he put his spirit in our hearts. We see that manifested here in scripture. Like the disciples who were overjoyed at the sight of Jesus's hands and side, it's my prayer that you know the joy, that you recapture that joy each time you remember what Jesus has done for you. Through faith in him, each one of us received that peace that only our Savior can impart. That breath of God that is the life force responsible for creation, it hovered over Jesus' disciples and every believer. Jesus blesses us with the words, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Jesus leaves believers with five gifts. The first being his own presence. The secondly, his peace. Notice that Jesus left us, his disciples, with a mission, saying, I am sending you because he knew that in helping others, we help ourselves. And finally, Jesus blessed us with a companion, the Holy Spirit, and a message of forgiveness. Twice during this appearance, Jesus reassured his fearful followers, saying, peace be with you. We seem to need to hear that over and over, peace be with you. Jesus came to grant peace to his disciples then and now and forever. He has come to calm your fear and my fear. As we are locked down, may you know the peace that is secured only through faith in Jesus, the risen Savior. So where do we go from here? We go and share Jesus' message of peace. For in helping others, we help ourselves overcome fear. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you offer us your peace. You put your spirit in the hearts of those who believe in you. Forgive me for being distracted from you. Forgive me for trying to be liked by the world. Renew your peace within me that my fears, anxieties, and worries would melt away. In these days ahead, help us to be harbingers of your peace to the glory of your holy name. Amen. I'd like to leave you with a final benediction. 
May the strength of God sustain us, the power of God preserve us. May the hands of God protect us. May the way of God direct us. May the love of God go with us, now and forevermore. Amen.